Well, good morning, everybody. I'm speaking to you this morning from the church. As you can see, we thought we would give the uh, broadcasting live from the church a go as we hopefully at some time in the future will be able to worship here in the building as well as live stream at the same time. So we thought we would give it a crack. Yeah, forgive us if the technology breaks down, but we'll try our best. Speaking of the church, I've got one intimation for you. Remember, we have this, the cut session has given permission as well as presbytery for us to open St Blaine's building for private prayer. So the, the church is open every morning from 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock this week. We might change the times for next week, but this week, 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock. If you want to come to the church for a moment of prayer or to be prayed for, then do come along. Anyway, let's come to worship our Lord God on this day. The psalmist says, Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems you from life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Let's come with the psalmist to praise our God and rejoice in all of the benefits of being a follower of Jesus Christ. Let's worship God. Let's sing our first hymn from Mission Praise number 77, Christ Triumphant. you this morning. The God who has a plan. The God who, when the time was just right, sent your Son, born of a woman, to save us. We rejoice in you, the God who calls and saves us into a family. The God who adopts us 
as daughters and sons of you, our Heavenly Father. Lord Jesus, today we join the whole of creation to praise and worship you. You who are the firstborn of creation. Through you, by you and for you, all creation came into being. And so we praise you. Praise you, our Lord and Saviour. Knowing that you, our Lord, grant us such benefits. You bring fullness of life. You are the reason we live. You are the reason that we can call upon your Father as our Father. We rejoice in your cross, the cross that means so much for each one of us, the cross that speaks so loudly of costly grace. As you gave everything, even that last agonised breath, because you loved us. Lord, we confess the sin that you bore upon that cross. We are so sorry for the times when we cheapened that grace. That grace that took our sin seriously. And yet so often we live our lives not taking you or grace seriously. Lord, thank you that you restore us and renew us. That you always give us another chance. And so as we confess our sin before you, we can do so rejoicing that you forgive us, that you grant us freedom, that you fill our minds with the knowledge of you and salvation. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you would help us today to worship our God, that you, Holy Spirit, would help us to make Jesus the centre of all of our lives, that he would be our vision, that he would be the Lord of our hearts, that he would be the ruler of our lives, that we would be able to surrender all to him who surrendered everything for us. Praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And hear us as we join in Jesus' prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, young people, I've got a picture for you to see. It's a cartoon. Hopefully you can read this. I can barely see it. I'm not used to having the television screen so far away from where I'm standing or sitting. But you can see the teacher is saying to the, the young girl, you wrote Jesus for every answer. Was it in a maths test? And the wee girl was saying, well, yeah, mum told me that Jesus is the answer to everything. Now, sometimes in church, ministers, and of course, children and families, workers, get a bit of stick because every question they asked during a children's talk, the answer, always seems to be Jesus. There's a famous joke about a wee boy who shouts out the answer with Jesus when it's not that answer at all, but I can't quite remember what the joke is. But in a way, the answer always is Jesus. Not to maths problems, that won't get you correct scores on a maths test, but everything to do with life. Because if Jesus is the answer what is the question? Who is your Lord? Jesus. Who do you need in your life? Jesus. Who is with you always? Jesus. Who changes our lives? Jesus. Who died for our sin? Jesus. Who will make sure that if we believe in him, that we will be in heaven with him? Jesus. Boys and girls, we as Christians follow Jesus. Jesus is always the answer when it comes to faith and God and religion. And so today we rejoice that the answer is always Jesus. And we put Jesus at the centre of our church, of our lives, of our families, of our whole world. And we say thank you Jesus 
for all you have done. Now, one major thing that Jesus did, of course, he died on the cross for us to take all the wrong things we do. But then he rose again. Let's sing the Stuart Townend Resurrection hymn and remind ourselves of Jesus' resurrection. Paul's trial before Felix. Now we move into the beginning of Acts chapter 25 and Paul's trial before Festus. So let's hear God's word from Acts 25. The reading today is from Acts 25 verses 1 to 22. Three days after arriving in the province, Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem where the chief priests and the Jewish leaders appeared before him and presented the charges against Paul. They requested Festus as a favour to them to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem, for they were preparing an ambush to kill him along the way. Festus answered, Paul is being held at Caesarea, and I myself am going there soon. Let some of your leaders come with me, and if the man has done anything wrong, they can press charges against him there. After spending eight or ten days with them, Festus went down to Caesarea. The next day he convened the court and ordered that Paul be brought before him. When Paul came in, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him. They brought many serious charges against him, but they could not prove them. Then Paul made his defence. 
I have done nothing wrong against the Jewish law, or against the temple, or against Caesar. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favour, said to Paul, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me, there on these charges? Paul answered, I am now standing before Caesar's court, where I ought to be tried. I have not done any wrong to the Jews, as you yourself know very well. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. After Festus had conferred with the council, he declared, You have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you will go. A few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at the set at Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus. Since they were spending many days there, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. He said, there's a man here whom Felix left as a prisoner. When I went to Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews brought charges against him and asked that he be condemned. I told them that it is not the Roman custom to hand over anyone before they have faced their accusers and have had an opportunity to defend themselves against the charges. When they came here with me, I did not delay the, the case, but convened the court the next day and ordered the man to be brought in. When his accusers got up to speak, they did not charge him with any of the crimes I had expected. Instead, they had some points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a dead man named Jesus who Paul claimed was alive. I was at a loss how to investigate such matters, so I asked if he would be willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial on these charges. But when Paul made his appeal to be held over the emperor's decision, I ordered him held until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear this man myself. He replied, tomorrow you will hear him. Thanks, Sarah. Let's sing again. Now, most of our hymns and songs today are all about the resurrection, and I hope you can see why from Acts chapter 25. So our next hymn is from Mission Praise number 357, Jesus Christ is Risen Today.
So let's turn to Acts chapter 25, or the first part of the chapter, and another one of Paul's trials. And the theme for our sermon today is this, keeping Jesus the issue. As we said with the kids, uh, often the answer to the Sunday school question is always Jesus. And uh, that in many ways, that is very true. It's also quite funny, of course, if, you, if it, uh, the minister or the youth worker asked a completely different question. But keeping Jesus as the main issue is what our faith, Christianity, is all about. And that's what Paul does. And we see that time and time again through all of these trials. We may be asking ourselves, why does Luke record trial after trial after trial? Well, it is God's word, and it's there for a reason. And we can learn from Paul, we can learn from each defence, because they're all slightly different, and we can be challenged about how we keep Jesus as the main issue in our lives. Now, last week, at the end of chapter 24, Paul had been put on trial by Felix, who was the Roman governor of the area. And Felix seemed to uh, take cold feet about giving a verdict about Paul's innocence or guilt. So we read at the end of chapter 24 that Felix was succeeded by Festus, but because Felix wanted to grant favour to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. So Paul has been left in prison for two years. Paul's lockdown, if you like, has lasted two years. Now we are struggling, most of us, after three and a bit months of lockdown, but Paul was there in prison for two years. Don't jump over that fact. So he's there while Felix's reign or uh, duty as governor comes to an end, and then Festus, this man, is appointed here at the beginning of chapter 25. And Festus, being a good Roman governor, arrives in Caesarea and decides that he should go and survey the area of which he is governing. And so in verse 1 of chapter 25, within, after only three days of arriving in the province, Festus goes up to Jerusalem, where he meets the chief priests and the Jewish leaders. They come and appear before him, and verse 3 tells us they request Festus as a favour to them to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem, for they were, people, Luke tells us, for they were preparing an ambush to kill him along the way. Now don't forget, two years have passed. Two years. And the second that this new governor arrives in Jerusalem, here we have the high priest and the rest of the Jewish council coming to him and going on again about Paul. Clearly, two years hasn't lessened their desire to get rid of Paul. In fact, it's probably made it worse. They wouldn't let it lie, as they say. Nursing their wrath to keep it warm, perhaps. Sad, but not unexpected. And so, as soon as they get an opportunity before Festus, they present their charges and ask for Paul to be brought to Jerusalem. And as Luke tells us, like the last time with Felix, they have a plan to kill Paul. Festus is the new governor. He wants to see the land that he is governing, but he's also not daft. Verse 4, he answered, Paul has been held in Caesarea, and I myself are going there soon. You come to Caesarea. Verse 5, if the man has done anything wrong, you can press charges against him there. Festus remains neutral if the man has done anything wrong, you can press charges, but he's not willing to bow to the Jewish leaders. And so Festus goes back to Caesarea, and after uh, some time, the Jewish leaders go back, go to Caesarea. And after arriving there, the very next day, Festus convenes the court in verse 6 and orders Paul to be brought before him. Verse 7, when Paul came in, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood round him. They brought many serious charges against him. Now, we have been there before. Paul has been there before. But something else is happening again that happened before. Note what Luke says at the end of verse 7. They could not prove them. 
We are told that the charges are made. Commentators agree that it was probably the same charges, a rehash of the charges they'd said two years before, but equally, they couldn't prove. Easy to accuse, not always as easy to prove your accusation. But we think that they added one new charge in. Luke doesn't record it, but when we see what Paul's answer was, we can, yes, speculate, but I think we can speculate with good reason as to what that extra charge. See what I mean? See if you agree. Verse 8, then Paul made his defence. Now remember, he is defending himself against the charges that have been made by the chief priests and the Jewish leaders. Paul says, I have done nothing wrong against the Jewish law. We've heard that before. Or against the temple. We've heard that before. Or against Caesar. Now, some commentators, and I agree with them, think that that means that Paul is saying, I've done nothing against Caesar, that the Jewish leaders who came with their charges have added in something about Paul doing something against Rome. They've had two years to think about this, haven't they? And so they up the ante. They think if they get Paul done for something to do with Rome, they are more likely to receive a good result. Festus can't argue if Paul has done something against Rome. We are told that Festus, although he's at his own, his own man, he's neutral, he still is not daft and he wants to keep the peace. He wants to make sure that this land uh, which he governs, which is a difficult place to be as Roman governor, of course. Pilate knew this, uh, Felix knew this, and Festus knows this as well. He is wishing to do the Jews a favour. And says to Paul, uh, verse 9, Are you willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial before or there before these charges? He wants to keep the peace Festus. He says to Paul, do you want to go? But Paul's not daft either. And in verse uh, 10, says no. Paul says, no, I'm standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried. Remember Paul, Roman citizen. I have not done anything wrong to the Jews, as you yourself know very well. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. Remember, Paul has got eyes on heaven. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. So even if they can prove something against him, he's willing to be, to be martyred, because for him death is gain. But... If the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. Paul knows he won't get a fair trial in Jerusalem. He may or may not know of the plan to ambush him. In fact, he does know about it because his nephew told him about the, that, the very same thing, didn't he, in the, the trial against Felix, under Felix. He's willing to put himself before a Roman court and even take the charges and even take the, the, the verdict, if it's uh, even death itself. But he can't hand himself over to the, to the Jewish leaders. And so Paul plays his trump card. I appeal to Caesar. And Festus has no choice. After he conferred with his council, he declared, You have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you will go. Now, of course, Paul knows that God has told him he's going to be in Rome to testify. This is the way that God is working out his providence, working out that Paul gets to Rome. But Paul is also completely right by Roman law. And so the trial in front of Festus really comes to an end. Again, with no verdict, but basically plans are beginning to be put in place to bring Paul to Rome. But here's, a, and again, just like we saw with Felix, the conversation that takes place after the trial is as important as what happens during the trial. And again, we see here, a conversation takes place after the trial. Because we're told in verse 13, a few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus. Now, King Agrippa is the uh, great-grandson of Herod that was there at Jesus' birth, you know, killing babies in Bethlehem and all that. 
He is a puppet king. He has a very small kingdom in Judea given to him by the Romans. He came to the throne when he was 17 and deemed too young to rule the kingdom. And that's why the, the kingdom came under, it was still under Roman governorship, if you like. And so when the new governor comes to govern, King Agrippa makes like a royal visit, a state visit, if you like, even though he's really coming to kowtow to Rome to come and see the new governor, Festus. He brings Bernice with him. Now, she is his sister. Now, one of the main issues with Agrippa was not only that he had no faith in Christ or that he was a puppet king, but one of the main issues was it was suspected that Bernice was a bit more than his sister. In fact, the Jewish historian Josephus says that this was an incestuous relationship. But anyway, they arrive and come and spend time with Festus. And as they're there, they're obviously talking about a lot of different things, about Rome, about Jerusalem, and they like getting to know each other. And during the conversations, Festus brings Paul's case up to Agrippa. Because remember, Festus' main uh, priority is keeping the peace. He doesn't want anything going wrong, any riots in Jerusalem and the like. So he uses his contacts, Agrippa if you like. He tells Agrippa, when I went to Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders brought charges against him and asked that he be condemned. I told them that it's not a Roman custom to hand anyone over before they'd face their accusers and have an opportunity to defend themselves. And when they came here, he says, I did not delay the case, but convened the court the next day and ordered the man to be brought in. But when the accusers came in, they did not charge him with any of the crimes I had expected. That's a good point to note this. Festus is saying to Agrippa, their accusations were not what I expected. So what did they accuse? Well, again, we can hear uh, something of what the, the dispute was from Festus's mouth, verse 19. Instead, they have some points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a dead man named Jesus, whom Paul claimed was alive. It was alive. Remember we said last week, this is a theological issue. This is not a civil case. This really has nothing to do with Rome. This is about Paul and uh, the Jewish leaders who disagree about who Jesus is and also disagree about the resurrection. But note what we have here, because this is again, and this is what I'm saying, this conversation helps us to see something. What do we have here? We have two men talking about Jesus Christ. Two men who are not believers, who are pagans, who are Romans, who probably worship false gods and the like, talking about Jesus. They talked about their own religion and about a dead man named Jesus who Paul claimed was alive. Festus goes on, I was at a loss to investigate such matters, so I asked if he'd be willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial, but Paul said no, and appealed to Caesar, to, so to Caesar he must go. And Agrippa is interested, it's funny all these guys get interested with Paul and John the Baptist and the like, they want to hear more. We saw that with Felix, he had many conversations with his wife Drusilla with Paul, and Felix and Agrippa is no different. He said, I'd very much like to hear from the man. And we'll see that next week at the end of chapter 25 and the beginning of chapter 26. Now maybe as we said earlier on, we're wondering, what on earth have all these trials got to do with us? Well, this is how God gets Paul to go. But they also teach us something about our lives as believers. Because I think the key verse in all this is this verse here. Instead, they have some points of dispute with them about their own religion and about a dead man named Jesus, whom Paul claimed was alive. Paul keeps Jesus the issue. Paul constantly talks about Jesus, who he is, what he did, and what happened to him. Paul claims that Jesus is alive. Now, we know it's much more than a claim, because Paul met him on the road to Damascus, of course. But we see Paul talking 
always about Jesus. Keeping Jesus the issue. Here we have two, a Roman and a, a king, talking to each other about Jesus because of Paul's testimony. Now people sometimes glibly say that all religions are the same. Now all religions may have similar characteristics, they may even have some belief that overlap in some way, or, but they're all different. Religions are not all the same. But Christianity is different in many ways. Because Christianity is all about Jesus Christ. The clue is in the title. It's all about him, his teaching, what he says. He says he is the only way to the Father. He teaches about grace being a free gift that we can't earn, that he comes to sacrifice, he, God, comes to sacrifice himself for us. And of course, the small matter of Jesus rising from the dead and encountering people like Paul and hopefully you and us. As that quote says, Christianity is different from all our religions. They deal with the story of man's search for God, the gospel deals with the story of God's search for man. Christianity is different because Jesus is the issue. A dead man who became alive. One of the greatest proofs of Christianity that there is. Jesus truly died and he truly rose again. No one else, no other religious leader has pulled that one off as far as I'm aware. Many of us know the, the pain of grief and bereavement. How it saps your life of energy. How it takes away your dreams, your hopes, fills your life with tears. Most of us have lived and walked through that journey. But imagine that the person that you loved and had seen die became alive again. You wouldn't stop talking about it, would you? We wouldn't stop telling them, you'll never guess what happened. So-and-so died, I saw it with my own eyes, but then they're alive again, look. Well, it's the same with our Lord Jesus. It was the same with Paul. He encountered Christ and couldn't stop talking about it. He hasn't stopped talking about it, even in the midst of a trial. A dead man named Jesus, whom Paul claimed was alive, says one man to another. Paul makes Jesus the issue every time. And just a wee note here about evangelism. We use this word in church, evangelism, which the Bible tells us we should all be involved in. Yes, some people are called to the specific task of being an evangelist, but all Christians are called to the general task of being uh, evangelising. What does that mean? We, we use this word and we get scared about it. It means telling people about Jesus. Simple as that. Just telling people about Jesus. We've seen these verses many times in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3. Who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Remember Paul saying, you know, if it's death, I'll take death. Peter says, even if we suffer, if we're suffering for uh, being a Christian, remember last week, uh, if Christianity became illegal, there would be enough evidence against you to convict you. But even if you suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats, do not be frightened. But here it is, verse 15. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behaviour in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Peter tells us we should always be ready to tell people about our hope in Christ. That Jesus was dead, but now is alive again. That we who trust in Jesus will also die, but we will also rise to be with him. But yet we get scared with this word evangelism. Peter tells us how to begin evangelism. Revere Christ in your heart. If Jesus really dwells in your heart, if he, you have really encountered the living Lord Jesus, then you won't want to talk talking about him. 
because you know him as the risen Lord. So it's about getting our hearts right, making sure we're in relationship with Christ, and then always being ready to give an answer to when people ask us, you know, why do you believe? Or we should be praying for opportunities for people to ask us. It doesn't always mean we start the conversation, but be ready to keep the conversation going. But what some other thing here we need to note between these two guys, Festus and Agrippa, because we again get uh, guilt when we think about being a, an evangelist or evangelism, because we think that evangelism means that we tell somebody about Jesus and they immediately become a Christian and everything is well. Well, that's not how it works. Paul talks about sowing seeds. Paul talks about watering other seeds. Paul talks about a harvest, you know, reaping a harvest that someone else has sown. It doesn't always happen there and then. It can take a long time. I've been reading this book, it's been very helpful, uh, Donald Whitney, a book called Spiritual Disciplines, and he asked the question, what is successful evangelism? Now, we might have that classic you tell somebody about Jesus and suddenly they fall to their knees and ask Jesus to be in their lives. That's not what Whitney says of successful evangelism is. If it was like that all the time, then that'd be brilliant. But it's not like that all the time. Successful evangelism is just telling somebody about Jesus. You have succeeded as an evangelist if you just tell somebody about Jesus. What they do with that, or what the Holy Spirit does with that, is up to the Holy Spirit, not up to you. If they reject it, then that's not your fault. If they accept it, then that's not your fault either. That's the Holy Spirit. Can you see what I mean? Paul shares the gospel at his trial, and we have Festus and Agrippa talking about Jesus. Now, neither of them, to our knowledge, become Christians. But they are talking about Jesus. Paul has succeeded in evangelism. Not everybody will believe. Jesus met a young man, didn't he? And the young man wanted to know how to get eternal life. And Jesus told him. And the young man shook his head and wandered away. Jesus had many disciples who gave up and wandered away. If that happens to Jesus, it's bound to happen to us. Evangelism is simply sharing who Jesus is. So as we come to this end of this trial, I hope you're encouraged, encouraged to see again Paul's single-mindedness, keeping Jesus the issue, focusing on who Jesus is, the Lord who is dead but who is now alive again. And then I hope you're encouraged to use every opportunity to keep Jesus centre in your life, to speak of the hope you know, once he is in your heart and then to leave God to do the rest and to rejoice that the God who is dead and is now alive is living with you now through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well let's begin to respond to this as we reflect and think these things through for ourselves. Firstly by listening to Mike's organ recital which is Charles, Charles Wesley's Pastoral. Thank you.
let's come and continue to respond with our prayers of thanksgiving and for others. Let us pray. Lord God, today we are full of thanksgiving that your Son Jesus is alive. We thank you that he shows and confirms everything about you, your power and your love and your mercy for us. Lord Jesus, we thank you for being here with us. We thank you that we encounter you as our Lord and Saviour, that you live in our lives. We ask you again into the centre of our lives, into our hearts. And as you come again, Lord, we rejoice that you bring strength where there is weakness, hope where there are doubts, light where there is darkness. Lord, thank you for calling us into this knowledge of you. Thank you for the ministry you give us all to testify about you, to testify about your love, to stand firm on the gospel to share the gospel, to sing of the love that we have of you. Lord, we pray today for those who face real persecution because they have followed you. Those who face danger in the Middle East, in China and the like, because they are yours. We pray, Lord, for us in this country, in Great Britain, in Scotland, a country that seems to increasingly be against Christianity, Lord, that saddens us, but more and more it begins to impinge on our lives and we wonder what we will face in our time or what our young people will face. But Lord, we thank you that you, through the power of the Holy Spirit, enable us to stand firm like Paul. So help us, Lord, to constantly be ready to give an answer, to not be afraid of any who seek to harm to not be scared of anything who seek to, to stop our, our mouths, but to make you the issue in our lives and in our speech. We thank you for the weapon of prayer that you have given us. Forgive us, Lord, when we pray too small or forget to pray at all. Lord, we pray for our church families, for those who are struggling with lockdown, for those who are undergoing treatment, for those who are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, for those whose loved ones are apart from them. Lord, we pray that your near presence would strengthen and bring hope to every situation that's on our minds and our, all of our different church families. We pray for our world where human sin and selfishness is seen so clearly even in these days. Lord, there's been so many great things of people helping other people. But also, Lord, in these past weeks and months, we have seen so many other things where sin has come, where people have judged or been judged by their skin colour, where people are harming each other, where wars and conflicts continue. We pray on, Lord, for all victims of violence in America and here in Scotland. We pray for the situation in Glasgow, that, Lord, that you would defuse any tension. We pray for David White, Lord, a, a boy who used to be in our church in Dorai. We pray that he would continue to recover. And we pray, Lord, that across our world, that a difference would be made, that people would judge people less and honour with integrity each human being. Lord, with Jesus, we thank you that you died but rose again, that you make the difference. We respond to you today. We give you our hearts, our lives. We give you our offering. Lord, we, you are challenging us in these days about our offering. Lord, we worship through our offering. Help us to give a, a fitting response to all that you have given us. And bless us now for your glory. And may we rejoice to sow seeds, to water other seeds, and even to see some harvest wherever we are. For your glory alone, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's close our service singing Mission Praise 178, reminding us all to go forth under social distancing uh, situations, of course, but tell. Go forth and tell. Thank you.
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen.